All right. Well, if you brought your Bibles, hopefully you did, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, and we'll be looking at verses 28 through 32. Uh, last week, of course, we finished, if you were here with us, our study on Christology. And next week, we'll start a new series. I mentioned it briefly on Sunday morning. Um, so next Wednesday, we'll start a new study, a character study on Barnabas. Um, we'll learn how to be a, a be an encourager versus a discourager. So if you're a discourager, uh, you'll learn how to be an encourager. Okay. But uh, Matthew 21 verses, Matthew chapter 21, we'll be looking at verses 28 through 32. This is the parable of the two sons, uh, and so we'll be looking at that uh, this evening. And again, next week we'll start a new series on Barnabas. Uh, I'm going to read this quote to you. It's by an author. It says, The evidence of knowing God is obeying God. Pretty simple, isn't it? And that is in many ways what the parable teaches. It's talking about obedience, the need to obey the Lord, to be obedient to Him. And uh, we'll see more on that as we go along through this very short parable unique to Matthew's Gospel but tonight, when we look at this parable, again, I've used this expression when we've done some parables along the way or on Sunday nights with Matthew, or excuse me, with Mark, rather, uh, that Jesus often called a master storyteller. Uh, he weaves these stories, and they're just absolutely brilliant, and they make you think. Some of them are very involved. This one is very simple. No hidden meanings, no hidden methods. There's nothing. It's a very simple uh, parable, uh, and it teaches largely on the need for obedience. Um, but what we're going to look at in this parable is what did the parable mean at the time, in other words, in the setting to the individuals, and it's directed towards the religious leaders of the day. But then we'll see some principles that we can learn from it as well. So I know you, some of you like to take notes, so the way that we'll look at this short parable is the first thing we'll do is look at the setting of the parable. Uh, I'll kind of explain when it is where it's at in the life of Jesus. It actually fits fairly well with where we'll be resuming in Mark's gospel, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. So it does fit kind of in that same time period. But in terms of the parable itself, verses 28 through 30, the two sons, and uh, it's a short parable. So again, we'll look at the setting of the parable. When did it happen in terms of the life of Jesus? Then we'll look at the two sons, which is the parable proper. It's verses 28 through 30. And then Jesus gives the interpretation as well as the application. In other words, what it means and what we can do with it in verses 31 through 32. Okay? More on that later. But basically, when we look at the parable, parables, you need to know the context of them. If you don't know the context of them, nine times out of ten, when you rip it out of context, you lose its meaning. And we won't be able to fully understand what's going on. So let me take just a few minutes to kind of explain the setting of the parable. It's fairly straightforward. Matthew's gospel, of course, presents Jesus largely as the Messiah, the King. In other words, if I was going to preach a series of sermons on it, I would somehow use the word King. Because Matthew presents Jesus as, of course, the King of Israel. The way that the gospel is structured is he's presented to the nation of Israel, but then alongside of that is opposition by the nation of Israel. Does that make sense? He's presented to the nation as this is the king. Alongside of that is the opposition, and the opposition grows as you get closer to, of course, what we think of as the crucifixion, of course. Uh, so that's sort of the general way in which Matthew is describing Jesus. He's the king. And he gives him his credentials, for instance, in chapter 1. And then it shows throughout how he is the Davidic king. But it also shows sort of parallel to that how the nation objects to him. There's a lot of opposition. Now, if you look at chapter 21, verse 1, you probably recognize that. It's the triumphal entry. When we start Mark, not this Sunday, when we, in other words, we resume, but the following Sunday, we will be in this exact setting, which is the Passion or the Easter week, um, the final week of the Lord Jesus. So this is where we are. We are in that final week of Jesus, that week of the triumphal entry and all of that. Now, we actually can figure out pretty well which day of the week this is. Uh, 
So Jesus entered into Jerusalem on which day? Not a trick question. Sunday. All right? The triumphal entry, Sunday. If you look at verses 17 and 18, you can tell what day of the week this parable is told on. Notice verse 17 of chapter 21. He left them and went out to the city, uh, to Bethany, and he spent the night. So this will be Sunday night as we think of it. But then notice in the morning, what does he do? He goes back to the city, and we have that barren fig tree story that's told. Jesus goes to the temple and then would retreat in the evenings, you might say, during that week. So what we have is on Monday, so the day after the triumphal entry, Jesus goes and he returns and he has this encounter once again with the religious leaders. So the context of the story, of the parable in other words, is verses 23 through 27. So Jesus on that Monday, he returns and immediately... When he enters into the temple, verse 23, the chief priest and the elders, the religious leaders, they question his authority. And that's sort of the basis of it. So imagine Jesus going to the temple once again. He encounters the religious leaders, and they begin to challenge his authority. Okay? And what they essentially do in, in verses 23 through 27 is they want to cause this dilemma by asking him this question. You know, in the life of Jesus, they like to ask him questions. They don't want to know what the answer is. They just want to trick him. Okay? They understand they don't care. They don't want to know what the answer is. They want to trick him. Now, the, what they do is they ask him, and you can read it on your own, 23 through 27. They say, if he claimed his authority from God, they were going to charge him with blasphemy. If he says that he has his authority from men... Well, he wasn't a true prophet. So in their minds, they're thinking, okay, what authority does he have to do any of this stuff he's doing? And so he puts, so basically what they do is they put him in this paradoxical situation. And you know what Jesus always does? He takes and twists it and turns it back on them and asks them a question and says, you answer this and then I'll tell you where my authority comes from. Notice what he does, because this plays into the parable, because at the very end of the parable, he goes back to this question. So he asks in verse 25, the baptism of John, where did it come from? Did it come from, notice what he does, heaven, or does it come from men? So Jesus turns the table on him, because essentially what he's saying is, if John came baptizing in his message from God, why didn't you believe it? If, of course, John was no more than a man, they would have been terrified because people loved John the Baptist. A lot of the crowd did. So they end up getting twisted in a knot because if they answer and say, well, John came and his message was of God, then the obvious question is, why didn't you listen? If you said he was nothing more than a man, they would have been afraid of the crowds attacking him because a lot of the crowds loved John. John was very well received. So what essentially Jesus is pointing out here is that they claim to be obedient to God, but in reality they were really disobedient. You ever heard the expression saying one thing and doing the other? This is essentially what the layman's version of that is. He is actually charging them with saying, you say that you are obedient to God, but your actions show that you're actually disobedient. Now imagine how mad they would be. That'd be like me dragging the board before the church saying, you claim to be believers of the Bible, but you don't do it by your actions. You imagine what would happen. People would be like, oh, can you believe he said that? Remember, Jesus was not worried about offending people, was he? He didn't seek it out, but sometimes offense comes. So Jesus launches into this series. There's three parables. We're only going to look at the first one. Um, and essentially this first one is a very simple story, and it teaches, of course, about obedience. It's unique to Matthew. Now, I'm going to read something, and then we'll look at the parable itself. Uh, Charles Swindoll has this interesting way of looking at this parable. It's not anything elaborate, but I'm going to refer to it later. He says the first story, he means the first parable in the three here, concerns two, ain't, two unnamed sons. The first one is, I won't, and the second one is, I will. He does this because at the very end, 
Jesus flips this around because your natural reaction is, I won't is a negative, and I will is a positive. But Jesus is going to twist this around, and we'll talk about that later. So the story is this parable of these two sons, and uh, someone read verses 28 through 30. So with all that said, Jesus begins to tell this series of three parables. We're looking at the first one. The second and the third ones are elaborations of this one. But someone read verses 28 through 30. That's the parable itself. Okay, so the way I like to look at the parables, of course, so we have the basic context, right? So Monday of that week, and Jesus' authority is being challenged. He twists it, if you will, in other words, turns it back on them, and that launches him to three parables. This is the first one. The first one is an easy, simple parable. If you do want to read the other ones, uh, it's the next one is verses 33 through 46. It's the parable of the landowner. It's sort of, if you will, an expanded version of this, sort of. Uh, and then there's the parable of the marriage feast, which starts in the next chapter. But this one is pretty straightforward. So the basics of the parable is there's three people. There's, of course, the father and his two sons. Now, if you notice the father, a couple of things with this is the father gives the exact same instructions, we'll look at this in a few minutes, to both the sons. Go work in the vineyard and do it right away. In other words, don't ask questions. He expects obedience and obedience to be immediate. Does that make sense? Pretty simple. Now, when you start thinking about, okay, what in the world's a vineyard? Why does he use the expression of a vineyard? Well, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 7 and let the Bible give us the answer to the question. Because uh, the vineyard is used a good bit, the reference, it's uh, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 7. So again, he's speaking to the religious leaders, if you will, of the day in the temple. And they would have been irate with him by the time he gets done with this. Because they knew exactly what he was talking about. So Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 7, I'll just read it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? No ambiguity, there's no mystery. Vineyard typically in the scripture refers to Israel. You can also see this if you wanted to in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 15. So you have the basics of the parable is that there's three individuals, the father with two sons. He gives the exact same instructions to both of the sons Go work in the vineyard, do it right away. I expect obedience, nothing less will do. And he tells them to go work, of course, in the vineyard, which refers to Israel. So let's look at the first son. The first son is in verses 28 through 29. The the reference I used with Charles Swindoll, he calls this one, I won't. And the I won't is the one we would think, man, I bet Jesus is going to just have a tale of a time with this guy because he says I won't but that's not quite the way it goes so you notice it says in verse 28 but what do you think that is a rabbinical way of asking a question so again he's really irritating them here I'm sure because that's a rabbinical expression and they're of course teachers of the law so he's just really irritating them here and you notice what he says a man had two sons and he came to the first and he said son go work in the vineyard. So he tells him to go work when? Today. The point is immediacy. Don't go home. Don't make an excuse. I expect obedience, and I expect obedience right away. But he doesn't do it, does he? Notice what it says. He answers back, no way. I'm not doing that. I will not. Now, if we just stopped right there, I know what we would all be thinking. This is the guilty one. This is the negative example, right? But notice the rest of it. But afterwards, he regretted it and went. In the Greek, 
to re, in other words, the regretted it, to regret something. It, actually, the Greek word, it's a long word here. Have you ever heard the Greek or, or it's a Greek word that stems off of meta, M-E-T-A. I'm going to read you what it says about what the actual meaning of to regret it means in the Greek here. It says, denotes a change, in particular, changing one's mind or purpose after having done something regrettable. So the first son was asked to go do something. He says, not a chance, no way, no how, I'm not doing it. But later on, something stirs in him this desire, and he regrets. He's remorseful, and eventually he's obedient. Now, is it ever too late to start obeying the Lord and his word? No. In other words, think about it this way. If you and I find out that we have been in disobedience to the Lord, or maybe we've known it for a long time. We know the Bible says one thing, and we just are refusing to do it. I know none of us would do that, right? Sort of like kick against what God's Word says. But then eventually we're obedient to it. Jesus is going to say that's good, better late than never. Obedience is the point of the parable. So even if we haven't been obedient late in life, it's still okay. Have you ever known someone, I have as pastor many, many times, who have had a, I'll just say, interesting history in life of disobedience to God, have no desire to follow Him. But then later on in life, for whatever reason, a multitude of reasons, they decide, you know what? I'm wrong, I regret it, I'm remorseful, I'm going to be obedient to the Lord and what He says some of those people are the most faithful and obedient to God. So it's never too late. So if you've been disobedient, it's never too late to begin to be obedient. Now let's look at the second one. So the first son is the one that says, I won't, as Swindoll calls it. And we would think that's the negative one. The second one is the one we would probably think, oh yeah, this one's got it together. But notice what verse 30 is. This is son 2. Swindoll, I like the way he calls it. He says, this is the one that says, I will. But notice what it says. So the man, this is the man being the father, came to the second son and said the same exact thing. So they both get the same instructions, the same response is expected, which is immediate, perfect obedience. Now notice how this one answered, I will and he even tacks on, sir, but what does he do? He doesn't do it. Interesting, isn't it? He doesn't actually do, so he's given the same instructions, but he even says, I'm going to go do it, sir, master, lord, but what does he do? Nothing. He doesn't do it. Yes, but he did not do what the Lord told him to do. He gave lip service. Now, have you ever had that happen to you before? And don't raise your hands. Read the Bible. Come and hear Pastor Stephen. And you're like, amen. And before we get out to the street, we don't do it. Or we don't fulfill what God has called us to do. What about us as kindergarten children? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, how do you do that? Yes. Turn with me to Psalm 40 and look at verses 6 through 8 with me. Because the religious leaders aren't the only ones who give lip service, are they? Because you and I can do that today, too. And I don't mean that negatively, but the point I want you to understand is that the end goal is obedience. And sometimes God is more interested in us being obedient. But I want us to look at something. I think this is a just interesting because I don't want you to get the impression either, because ultimately obedience, I know as a pastor, comes from a person's heart. I could drag you in here. I could drag you to go serve in some particular area, but eventually if your heart's not right with the Lord, what happens to that person? They quit. They won't do it, will they? But if the heart is right and the person wants to be obedient, they'll naturally begin to serve or whatever the Lord has for them. Someone read excuse me, Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. And we would think that the Israelites, the main thing for them to do would be what God was looking for them to do, which is sacrifices and so forth, right? External obedience. Someone read Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8 for me, or else I'll do it. Oh, okay. Sacrifice and offering. 
years on you. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law to the continuous of my heart. Okay, so that is essentially, if you think about it, many of the things Jesus teaches. The heart is the source of whether or not we really want to obey the Lord. Jesus says this in John 14, if you love me, you'll keep my word, my commandments, right? He doesn't say it the other way around. Typically what happens a lot of time is legalistically we think, well, we'll just do this, 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 and this. If we love the Lord, we'll naturally begin to do the things. And so what is the root? Well, you need to grow in your love for the Lord. If I can get you to love the Lord more and more, even every day, you'll naturally do the things that he has for you to do. Does that make sense? And so what we need to think about is how many times do we do the same type thing, right? Don't worry, Lord, I will obey you. Whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. And then we don't. We don't obey him and don't do what he wants. Now, well, let's go back now to the parable because Jesus gives us in this one, he actually gives us the interpretation. He also gives us what we might think of as the application or principle. So turn with me to Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew 21, verses 31 through 32. And again, remember, two individuals, two sons, if you will, I won't and I will. I won't, we would think, is the negative, and I will is the one that we would probably naturally think would be the one Jesus is, if you will, esteeming. But someone read verses 31 through 32, and Jesus will answer the question, but he's going to answer it in a way they would never have expected. Someone read the 31 through 32 for me. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the latter. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, that the tax gatherers and harlots will get into the kingdom of God before you. Whoa. <laughs> for, for John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax gatherers and harlots did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe him. All right. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the annotated version. I appreciated that. Yeah. Well, actually, in a lot of ways, that is true, isn't it? Because Jesus now gives the interpretation and the application. In other words, we can draw the principle from it. But the thing I want you to see is Jesus doesn't always do that. Sometimes he just throws these parables out there and you chew on them, as Gary would say, right? For a long, long time to try to figure them out. But here we don't have to do that. The emphasis, though, again, is on the religious leaders saying something, but doing something different, right? And this has broad, of course, principles, but let's get to those later, how we might do it. It's a simply a parable of lip service versus obedience. Christians, I think, lose their witness over this so many times, right? Uh, just simply mouthing the words and doing these things, but then when it comes time to be obedient, we don't always do them, do we? Of course, this is a much stronger one here. So let's look here, uh, minus Dave's uh, uh, annotated version. So the first son, who's the first son? Oh, it's the opposite of what we would think. The I won't are who? Tax collectors and the prostitutes. And what does he say? Goodness gracious, they'll enter into the kingdom of God long before you. That's just unreal. We tend to think of Jesus as light, fluffy, the least offensive person, but here he is going before them, and he says, these tax collectors and prostitutes, these harlots enter into the kingdom of God, and you won't even enter into them. They'll actually even go in before you even have a chance. Now, Matthew is what? What was his occupation? Isn't that interesting? In Matthew's gospel, he keeps bringing in tax collectors. He wanted to read. Will you read something for me? Because uh, Dave stole it from you last time. Read for me, and let's turn Matthew 9, 9 through 13. Because let me ask you, do you think if you were writing the gospel, if it was me, I would have not included tax collector? Because it would be like me saying... Well, I used to be, you know, a senior analyst and a project manager, and uh, they're harlots and sinners. There's probably some truth to that, but anyway, 
Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13, and this is Matthew's call into ministry. So, yeah, if you would you mind reading it? All right, thank you so much. Interesting, isn't it? Same idea, isn't it? All that long time later, the same idea, same problem. The religious leaders can't get over themselves. They think that they somehow earn God's favor, and there's no chance that these tax collectors, these harlots, these sinners... But Jesus, what is his point? Uh, It was read just a second ago. He says that, of course, a healthy person doesn't need a physician, but a sick person does... If you and I don't recognize our need to go to the doctor, that's not good, is it, if we need it? And that's sort of the idea there. You and I need to recognize that we are sinners and all fall short of the glory of God, and the only way we are saved is by grace through faith. It's all the work of God. But if we never recognize our need, we're never going to go and look for it, will we? It's like the publican and the tax collector, or the publican and the sinners, and we have all these uh, sort of stories here. But let's go back here to uh, Matthew chapter 21 and verse uh, 31 and 32 before we finish the parable here. So Jesus, of course, do you think he made them irritated, or do you think they thought, man, he's really warm and fuzzy and seeker-friendly? They would have been already irritated with him because in verse 28, he gives the rabbinical question is, what do you think? He knows that's the way they taught. And then he ends it by saying to them, the very people that you have condemned from the beginning of my ministry all the way to this final week, they're going to actually be the ones who enter into the kingdom of God and you will not. Odily would have blown their minds. It's amazing to me that he actually makes it to the cross over all those few years. They get so irritated with him. So the first son, I won't, actually is the positive. The second son, I will, is the negative. He just gave lip service, and he is equated to the second son, the religious leaders. Does that make sense? The first son, I won't, is actually the positive one, and it represents the tax collectors and the prostitutes. The second son is equated to the religious leaders, and they are disobedient throughout all of, we'll just say, Matthew. So what is the point? Well, two things. First is the Lord wants obedience, right? Pretty simple, isn't it? The the Lord requires us to listen, to read, to grow in biblical knowledge, but we also need to do the things that he calls us to do. It's a very simple principle. It's not complicated. Uh, I'm going to give you three scriptures. I'm going to read these just for time's sake. Uh, let's look at these. Luke 6.46. Obviously, in the religious leader's case, it's much more severe because their eternity is based on the fact that they are unwilling to recognize their need for Christ. But in this case, the Lord wants us to obey His Word. If I come and teach and preach to you three times a week and you don't do those things or endeavor to, I'll tell you that's probably the worst, isn't it? Because when you stand before the Lord, you're going to have a heavy burden on you already. But let's look at, uh, these are just three, just so you can um, have some references. Luke 6.46 says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? How many people, even Christians, say that Jesus is Lord, but don't do what he says? And uh, we're all guilty of those things. Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. Actually, I think I wrote this one down wrong. Well, we're going to skip that one because I wrote it down wrong. So, uh, see, pastor makes mistakes. I know you thought I might be. Without mistakes, I thought I'd check that. But uh, turn to James chapter 1, verse 22. We probably know this one, right? James chapter 1, verse 22. I wrote down the Romans one wrong. James 1, 
James 1.22 says, But prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. The point I want you to understand is the story is simple. The point is simple. The Lord wants us to be obedient and not simply say we're going to do what he wants us to do, but actually do it. What about this thing about John? Did you wonder why that he brought John into the parable at the very end? Or in the explanation of it? It's verse 32. Well, I told you in verses 25 through 27, what did Jesus start this with? Well, he turns the tables on them. If John came and was of God, why didn't you respond? Here he ends with, notice, for John came in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But what and who did? The tax collectors. But even after you saw the tax collectors and so forth, the prostitutes, notice what it says, did not even feel remorse afterwards as to believe in him. In other words, what his point is, John came, you didn't believe him because you didn't act on what he said, of course, meaning that he was preparing the way for the Messiah and so forth. Even when you saw the tax collectors and the prostitutes responding, you still didn't have remorse over it. Can you imagine how hard-hearted you would be? You'd be thinking to yourself, wow, you know, these tax collectors and sinners are responding. Even then, they are so hard-hearted, they still will not believe in Christ. Uh, let me just mention a couple things, and then I'll leave you time for questions. It's never too late to obey the Lord and His Word, is it? No matter how old we get, it doesn't matter how late in the game it is. We also need to put the Bible into practice. The Believer's Bible commentary sums of this up, I think, well. It says, uh, and I'll finish with this, It's not enough to receive the implanted word. We must obey it. There must be a deep desire to hear God speaking to us and an unquestioning willingness to do whatever He says. And that, in many ways, is what I want you to think about. Is Are we receiving the word and obeying it? Are we putting it into practice? And if not, why not?